Have you ever wondered how a Pokemon card is created? With so many new cards releasing every year, and 898 different Pokemon in existence, the Pokemon trading card game has established 25 years worth of different illustrations, but who decides which Pokemon becomes a Pokemon card? Where do the artists behind each card come from, and what's the process of taking a card from concept to the final illustrations that we appreciate every day? Well, naturally, there's a process, an extremely interesting one too. It's not as simple as just picking a Pokemon and then having an artist draw them. There's a lot of thought, care, and coordination involved in bringing these cards to life, as explained by esteemed artist Corky Saito, an extremely experienced illustrator who started his career contributing works for Fatal Fury and Super Robot Wars until he made his debut with Pokemon in 2002, working on Umikara no Kaze, known in English as Aquapolis. He's also my favorite TCG artist. Saito-san is responsible for so many amazing cards like the Charizard EX Secret Rare from CP6, also known as Japan's 20th Anniversary Collection, the Skytree Rayquaza promo, and more recently, the Espeon VMAX Special Art. He's also the man behind the Crystal Charizard from Sky Ridge, which still eludes me to this day. So how has one man continued to produce amazing illustrations for nearly 30 years? Surely he's got some refined methodology that he can share with us. Well, back in 2018, he did. Saito-san detailed his approach with fans in this article, which was written to guide budding artists who were entering the Illustrator Grand Prix. That's Japan's version of the illustration contest, which coincidentally is running again this year. Now, the whole article was written in Japanese, which is why today I thought I'd translate it for you. So let's have a look at how a Pokemon card is created. First and foremost, Saito-san believes the most important thing is how he can turn what he's imagining into an illustration. And while that may be difficult at times, that's what makes it fun. He says that there's no correct way to draw and that it totally depends on the artist's direction, which is why there's a few Pokemon card game no irasu wa igaku toki ni kokoro gakuteru koto, or in English, things he keeps in mind when drawing for the Pokemon card game. Ultimately, these illustrations are for cards, and this is something Saito-san always keeps in mind when creating these drawings. When you think about it, illustrations need to be ultra detailed and large. They need to tell a story, all while fitting into a relatively small canvas size. So, to ensure that he captures every element of the illustration, he splits things up into groups. In particular, the Pokemon, the background, and the effects. So, rather than draw everything at once, he'll split the Pokemon up from the other elements first. That way he can check the form of the Pokemon, and then he'll get to work. The first step is selection of the Pokemon, researching the Pokemon, and determining the composition. Saito-san says that the start of a commission will often begin with Creatures Inc. outlining which Pokemon to draw and a rough setting. In case you're wondering who Creatures Inc. are, they're a company founded by ex-staff members from Ape, the team who developed Earthbound on the SNES. After its release in 1995, they formed Creatures Inc. and went on to create the Pokemon trading card game. It's a little known fact that many people, such as character designers and editors, are involved in the process of creating a card. This is something that's been mentioned before by Shibuzo. She's the artist behind the amazing Galarian Moltres V special art from Matchless Fighters. In a tweet, she confirmed that illustrations are a collaborative process that involves direction between the artist and Creatures Inc., which suggests that a general direction is provided by Creatures and then it's up to the artist to drive it home. More often than not, Saito-san is responsible for drawing Pokemon that have already been turned into Pokemon cards before which is to be expected considering they've been making Pokemon cards for 25 years. Today, Saito-san is going to show us how he draws Eevee, an absolute fan favorite that everybody is familiar with. So to start, he conducts research to avoid drawing Eevee in a style that's already been done. And that's where the card search function on the Japanese trainer's website comes in handy. Although if you search up Eevee cards, a lot of the results are actually going to be his. After all, he's the man who drew all those Poncho Eevee. Saito-san says that Pokemon need to be presented in a particular way, and the source material needs to be followed carefully, so he'll often utilize Pokedex 3D Pro on the 3DS to help appreciate the pose a little more. As he progresses with rough sketches, he's always very careful not to make mistakes, and while he sometimes gets that balance wrong, it's nothing he can't fix. Now because Pokemon are living things, he always tries to draw them in the moment to make them feel alive. He tries to capture the strength they have while moving and living. But for this Eevee, he's going to try and capture a sense of stillness, which leads to the next stage, Rafusakusei to Rafukanshuteishutsu, or 
the rough sketch, and the rough submission. Once he establishes a pose, a viewing angle, and an image of the Pokemon, Saito-san will commence his draft, using copy paper and a blue pencil. He notes that while some artists like to draft digitally, he prefers to stick to the analog way using a light box. By flipping his draft around, he's able to make amendments to the line work, the viewing perspective, and overall just brush up the draft. This is his self-taught style, and by doing this, he finds it easier to see where the drawing perspective has deviated or been lost. Specifically, he uses a term here known as Pasu no Kurui. Pasu is the term given to perspective, which is kind of how we visualize positioning and depth in a drawing. Our eyes use the lines to infer whether we're looking at something from above, inwards, or outwards. So when the depth or perspective of a drawing is lost and we feel uncomfortable, or in Japanese we have iwakam, then it's hard to understand what's going on in the illustration. This phenomena is known as pasu no kurui, literally deviating from perspective in Japanese. Once the rough draft starts to take shape, Saito-san moves to a PC, scanning the work so far and it's here where he makes corrections, adds things like the background and some early effects. You've got the wind blowing through, warm sunlight from the east, a grove of trees and some leaves scattering about, with Eevee curiously gazing skyward. This is the draft that Saito-san will then send to Creatures Inc. for review, and provided everything is okay, it's then passed on to the official Pokemon company for their editorial check. Through the supervision process, he'll typically receive advice regarding balance and some of the finer details that need to be addressed. For example, in the rough draft, the tail was a little too large, so they asked that he shrink it a little bit, some distinction between Eevee's heel and buttocks was needed, and Eevee's neck fur was drawn as one whole tuft, but it needed to be split into parts. From here, it's just a matter of implementing the changes and suddenly the draft is coming to life. When you compare the two, it's a real testament to how rigorous the process must be, especially when each new set is introducing hundreds of new cards. The amount of rough drafts Saito-san will draw depends on the situation. He says there are times where he can draw a lot in bursts and there are also times where no matter what pattern he draws, he isn't satisfied. When that happens, he'll revisit the first iteration. He says that what inspired him first should be treated with care. This is a philosophy that I try to incorporate when I'm creating too. When you think about it, there's a reason why that spark lit the fire in you to begin with. Now that the draft sketch is mostly complete, it's time for step three, coloring. Most of the time, Saito-san will use Photoshop for coloring. His process is relatively straightforward. Before applying color, the first step is to finalize the line work based on the draft. Next, he'll paint the base colors, then prepare a shadow layer, and finally lay them together and apply some shine. If you recall back at the start, Saito-san approaches the illustration group by group, so at this stage, the Pokemon is mostly complete. That means it's time to move on to the background. Now, because the Pokemon is the lead actor of the illustration, ultimately, he doesn't think it's necessary to draw a background with ultra-fine detail you want the Pokemon to stand out from the background. Having said that, he always tries to use colors in the background that help with visualizing the situation that the Pokemon's in, oftentimes choosing colors from past works as reference. So I guess you could say that the background plays a large role in setting the scene for the actor. For this background, Saito-san wanted to capture the image of sunlight passing through trees in the forest. First, he details the ground, then the grass, then the inner tree branches, then some more grass, then the shadows, a little bit of atmosphere, and finally, sunlight, and then layers them all together. At this point, things look mostly complete and you really start to get an appreciation for just how detailed the card illustrations are, but there's still a little ways to go to get things looking perfect. So it's time for step four, the finishing touches. I think the craziest thing that this article taught me was just how important that last step is in tying the whole thing together. It's literally the cherry on top. and I guess that's why he leaves the effects till last, rather than adding them in as he goes. So to draw out more perspective, Saito-san blurs the Sakura in the foreground and adds a haze over Eevee to give him a bit of shine. And again, because they're the lead, he wants Eevee to stand out, so he also adds an edge light to further emphasize them. By blurring and shading off the inner part of the background and adding this extra shine to Eevee, Saito-san creates a sense of depth that really separates them from the background, and that's integral to making the whole thing feel real. At first, I was a little bit confused as to how Saito-san adds something intangible, like atmosphere.
But then it hit me. By adding some Sakura to the foreground and applying noise with the use of dust, he's able to create a glistening wind effect that you can really feel. Finally, he adjusts the color of the entire illustration, applying a color tone correction layer and it's complete. Eevee, standing still and gazing at the Sakura petals floating through the wind. If you can share the same feeling as that, then Saito-san has achieved his goal. And if you were wondering why you haven't seen this card in the wild before, that's because it hasn't been included in any release just yet, so who knows when we might see it. At the end of the article, he leaves a message that really sums up the beauty of Pokemon cards, so I'm excited to share it with you here today. I get excited thinking about what kind of feelings the finished illustration will evoke, so while I'm drawing, I'm always asking myself, does this illustration have the feeling of a Pokemon living with us in our daily lives? Saito-san, as always, I can't wait to see what you draw next, mate. I'm OK J Love. Thank you so much for watching.